Hello and welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 10 and today we're talking about strings. Um, uh, in some programming languages strings are pretty straightforward and just work. Uh, in Rust you're much closer to what's really happening in the computer and that means uh, at first glance I, I would say the topic of strings in Rust is pretty intimidating. There's, there's a lot of different concepts uh, to get your head around. So I guess the first thing to acknowledge is um, strings are, are not straightforward but they are definitely understandable. You just need to, I guess, drop your assumptions that everything is just going to work for you without thinking about it. Okay, so what is a string? A string is um, some text, uh, and in particular, the string class with a capital S is like a resizable um, chunk of text. And the, in Rust, the definition of text that they uh, that we use for the, um, in this area is that it's some UTF-8. So if you want to deal with strings that are different uh, encoding you can but the built-in string classes um, are always handling UTF-8 uh, which is the most common way of encoding uh, Unicode strings as in strings that could have all kinds of exciting characters inside them um, uh, and that's for in my opinion is a really good choice every language under the hood has to choose um, what encoding it's going to use for its kind of default string types and different languages use, use different choices. I definitely think UTF-8 is the best choice. Um, but something that's a bit, maybe a bit different about Rust is that that choice is much nearer to the surface. As a programmer, you're more aware of that choice than you are in a language like Java or something like that. Okay, so um, uh, what is a string? Well, a string with a capital S is a thing that is a bit like a vector, um, as in it's a bunch of bytes, because UTF-8 is bytes. So it's like a vec of U8, um, as in a, a, a list of bytes. Um, but uh, inside, the, the bytes that are inside that string are guaranteed to be valid UTF-8. So there are some sequences of bytes that are not valid UTF-8. So those are just not allowed in a string. They're allowed in a vec of U8 if you want them. Um, but if you've got a string, you know it's got UTF-8 inside it. Uh, and like... There are various places where your program will crash if you try and put stuff that's not UTF-8 in there. Or you can do a checked version. You don't have to crash. Um, yeah, so just like a VEC, uh, string class is a little bit of stuff on the stack, which is like just like some things telling it where to look on the heap and how much space is allocated on the heap and stuff like that. Um, and then the main stuff, the resizable string itself, is on the heap, and that's because... It's resizable, so that's where you have to keep it. So under the covers, a string looks a lot like a vec of U8, but then when you um, use it, it's much more convenient. So here's some ways you can use a string. So first of all, here's how you make a string. You say string colon colon from, and then you give it a string literal. So this is not this thing with the quotes is not a string. You make a string from it by calling string colon colon from. We've seen this already in these videos. Um, and then you've got some methods you can call on it once you've got this. So this S now is a string. Once you've got that, you can call methods on it, like split, or here, split once. So this will split it into um, two parts, before the space and after the space, and all, all the stuff after the space, because it's called split once. And there's also ways of splitting, so you can get multiple chunks. Um, you can ask for the length of the string. Now that is the length in UTF-8 code units which is not the same as the length in UTF-8 or in Unicode code points. So yeah, so this is the number of bytes. Um, uh, you can also call methods like starts with and ask, does, does this string start with um, this string literal? You can, you can convert it to so make a new string that is all uppercase versions of this using the Unicode like case rules, which are surprisingly complicated. Um, you can also call this lines method on a string and it will give you an iterator over each line. So you'll get a hello world and then you'll get a see you um, at each time around the loop. Um, so that's quite a convenient method. It gives you an iterator based on the new line characters in your string. So anyway, that's just a random collection of methods that might be of interest. Um, and yeah, so... Um, I already mentioned string literals, so this is a completely different thing from a string. Like, highly related, obviously, but completely different. So here, S1 is a string literal, um, which means 
that this this string hello world you wrote it in your source code and effectively that's been converted into bytes which are, i guess it's already bytes in your file but um in, in that, that that string in your source code has been built into your executable file um, and then you can refer to it later in your program and then if you want to make a string from a string literal um you, you use string from as we've seen. So the key thing to understand here is that this S1 is pointing at the bytes that are actually like in built into your executable. So the idea of like changing them doesn't make any sense at all. So that's the difference between uh, like a, the, how you're handling a string literal versus um, a string. Uh, like S2, you can you could make that mutable. You could modify that because it has this mechanism of pointing to stuff on the heap, and if it needs to point somewhere else on the heap because you need more space, then it can it can handle all of that. Whereas S1 is just pointing at some bytes um, that can never change. So we can make this a little bit more explicit by putting the types of these things here. So S2 is a string, as we said. Um, so this is one of these potentially modifiable things that has a pointer to stuff on the heap, whereas S1 is a as a reference to a str, we'll talk about what that means, and it also, in this case, it has a static lifetime. So static lifetime, you'll remember, means um, this never changes through the whole lifetime. This never this never goes away through the whole lifetime of this program. So these bytes, because they're built into like the XE of your program, um, they will never change, they'll never go away, they'll never run out of lifetime. So static lifetime means they last forever. And, and other than that, oops, it means uh, we, it, it's an ampersand str. So we've just left out the lifetime now just to make it easier. Um, and you will see this ampersand str all over the place in Rust code. And what that means is it's a reference to some bytes, which are definitely UTF-8, um, but it's a reference to them, not something that you own and can change or anything like that. Um, well, I mean, well, not something that you own, put it that way. All right, so let's talk a little bit about str. So you will never see str written on its own. You'll only see ampersand str. So let's try and talk about what what this really means. So um, we want we want a way of referring to part of a string, either because we've got it built into our executable, like we just saw, or because we um, someone has made a string and allocated some stuff on the heap, and we want to refer to some of the bytes of that string, maybe the whole of it, or maybe just a chunk of it. So ampersand str is our way of referring to like a chunk of bytes that are encoded in UTF-8. So um, here we're just talking about like how we might have represented this. So we could say it's like a it's like an array of U8. So we could have ampersand square bracket U8 square bracket, and that would be like an array slice pointing at those bytes in memory, whether they're on the heap or um, built into the XE or something else. Um, but the problem with that is that it doesn't actually express what we want to say because um, if it just if it's just as an array of a slice of u8 um, oh sorry yeah a slice of u8 then that doesn't express the fact that this is a utf8 encoded string so it's actually a string not just any bytes um, so we would kind of lose that information um, if we used that way of referring to like a chunk of string and that information is really really important by the way because like you can print it out or something like that if it's utf8 but if it's just a random sequence of bytes then um, uh, the, you know, you, you can't treat it as a string later without somehow checking. Um, but also, we couldn't say, oh, well, it's a slice of chars, because you'll remember chars are not UTF-8. Uh, a char is a is a 32-bit number, because, which could represent anything in Unicode. Whereas we've chosen to represent, or Rust has chosen to represent strings as UTF-8. So the, uh, Rust could have gone another way. It could have represented strings as UTF-32. So every string consisted of 32-bit characters stuck together, but that takes up a vast amount of memory for a lot of strings, which we tend to use in programming for things like, I don't know, JSON or HTML tend to be mostly um, Latin letters, mostly ASCII characters. So um, you would use up far more memory. So the choice that's been made, which I support, is um, that we represent strings in memory as UTF-8. So therefore, they're nothing like... This char thing doesn't make any sense because this is a string of 32-bit um, characters. Um, so it can't be that. So we can't we can't talk about U8. We can't talk about char. We have to talk about a, a some new concept, which is a chunk of memory which contains bytes, and those bytes are in UTF-8. 
and we call that str. And we don't put brackets around it, even though it basically has a similar meaning to bracket u8 bracket. We just call it str, I guess, because it would just be too much to type. Um, but as I said before, we don't we don't talk about str on its own. We only ever talk about it with an ampersand before it, because we can only refer to some of these bytes. Not uh, we we don't we don't pass them around as a chunk. So this table is trying to kind of help us think about strings and vex and how they kind of relate to each other. Um, and if you don't remember how vex work, maybe look back at the um, um, the stuff the the video about uh, heap and stack and the video about uh, vex themselves. So um, the kind of simple, easy to understand thing is the dynamic world. So we have a vec, which is basically a resizable array. And we have a string, which is a resizable chunk of UTF-8, resizable array of UTF-8, I guess we could call it. Um, and then we have uh, in the static world, uh, in the kind of vec world where we've got like just any kind of thing uh, in a list, um, you have this thing called an array, which is basically... Um, example, imagine this was like U8 here. We could say um, an array of 10 u 8 So we'd actually have to say square bracket U8 semicolon 10. And that would be like the, uh, an array that is exactly this size that contains 10 U8s. And in strings, we don't really have that. We Like in theory, we could. It, it would be perfectly sensible to say um, here's an array of 10 bytes that are UTF-8. Um, but we don't really bother with that. It's not really something that's particularly useful, whereas for arrays it is. But what we do have is the kind of borrowed world. So we, um, when we've got a vec of, of t's, then if we want to have a reference to it um, for some code that doesn't know whether it's a vec or an array or something else, um, then we use a slice. And we say, uh, uh, so this is the, the kind of meaning of ampersand square bracket t square bracket is like a reference to something that is like a, a, an array of t or it looks like an array of t so this is a slice this is basically saying i'm referring to some subset of a, a vec or, or an array or whatever else and then ampersand str is the analogous thing to say i'm referring to some chunk of contiguous bytes which are utf8 of a particular length so that ampersand str by the way it does contain not just the like location in memory where we're looking for the beginning but also the length so it can be like a subset of a string um, yeah, and then the the only situation where we do have something that's a bit like the static uh, is string literals uh, in your in our code, and in that case, they are tick static of ampersand str. They're, they're, we just we just refer to them in the same way as this, but we know that the lifetime is static. So maybe that's confused you, or maybe that's uh, left you uh, with a little bit more understanding. But basically. I think the best way to think about this is a capital S string is like a vec of UTF-8 bytes and ampersand str is a, like a pointer to a chunk of UTF-8 in memory. Okay, so the question that you might be asking yourself is when should I put write down string? When should I write down str? So if you need a resizable thing or something that who's... Um, like can't, kind of can't be known at, at compile time you probably need a string um so for uh, for stuff where you're creating a thing and then adding some letters to it or whatever it's obvious you definitely need a string and generally for stuff where you own things um it's going to be a string so anytime you're making a struct you probably want a string in there because if you have a reference in a struct and of course ampersand str is a reference um life gets complicated you suddenly need to provide lifetimes on your structs so um uh, when you've got a struct, you probably want a capital S string, or that's my kind of rule of thumb if, when you're getting started. Um, but when it's an argument to a function, at that point, you should think carefully about it. And normally, you probably want an ampersand str. So imagine this function where we, I mean, like it's doing something dumb, right? It's just returning the length of a string by just calling len. But it's just an example. And it takes in a string called data. And it's just, at the moment, it's taking an ampersand and then capital S string. And that's a pattern you're, you don't see very often. It's probably wrong to do ampersand string. You probably want to either take a string by value or you want to take an ampersand str. So let's look at um, what we say. So yeah, you probably don't want ampersand capital S string. You probably want ampersand str. And in this case, it works perfectly, right? So ampersand str has a method len on it, which works exactly the same. Um, and what this means is that someone can call your method even if they don't have a capital S string. 
maybe they have um, a string literal. Maybe they're writing a unit test, for example, um, and they're just using a string literal to pass in um, this thing. So now those those people are allowed to use it, but also people who have a string are also allowed to use it because it's quite easy to go from a string to a reference to the contents of that string, which is what ampersand str is. So in general, you should probably be looking as an argument to a function to take ampersand str. Um, if you want to modify the contents inside, you might take an ampersand mute str, um, but that's pretty rare. You don't see that very often because you can't change the length of it. And I mean, that's quite subtle, right? Because even if you're changing the you're only changing like the code points of a string, as in the letters or numbers or whatever that are in there. In Unicode, that might change the length of it in bytes. So, um, yeah, taking an immutable str is pretty odd, I would say. So, if you want to modify the string, you probably want to like take in a string and return a new string, or maybe taking taking an ampersand str and return a new string. <clears throat> but if you genuinely want to actually modify the thing, you probably want to take in a mutable capital S string. So I would say the rule of thumb is um, <clears throat> if you can change it to be ampersand str as your function argument, uh, you probably should. If you find that you can't, then probably capital S string is, is the right answer. Okay, so um, I think it took me quite a while to get my head around how strings work. So do leave comments um, or ping me on Mastodon or talk to me in, in my matrix room. Um, hash Andy Balam colon matrix dot org, uh, and try and work this through. Right, like it takes a bit of thinking about. Uh, don't expect to immediately understand it. You probably need to try it out and stuff like that. But yeah, key message: strings are complicated. Capital S string is like when I own a thing, and ampersand str is when I'm referring to a string. All right, so that was um, the, uh, several videos now going through a load of different topics. Um, in what the these slides call like module A2, like what is it like advanced basics or something? I don't know. Um, so let's just just think through a little bit what we've done in the last few videos. So we've talked about how in Rust you own values. Someone definitely owns it, and then you can lend it out to other people. And there are rules around that, like only one person can have it, like this, like exclusive mutable uh, borrow. And that means we don't need garbage collection running in the background to tidy things up because the owner of a thing tidies it up when the owner gets tidied up itself. Um, then we have uh, these things called structs and enums. So structs are a way of saying something's built out of this and this and this and this. And enums are a way of saying something's built out of this or this or this or this. Then we looked at a few specific examples about how you handle errors. So you can either panic or you can return this thing called a result, which is like either it was okay or there was a problem. Uh, and if it was okay, this is the answer. And if there was a problem, here was the problem. Uh, option for like things that are either there or not there. Um, so result and enum are both, sorry, result and option are both enums. Uh, then we looked at how you define methods on on structs and enums, and also associated functions, which are basically things that like live nearby, namespace-wise, that you often use to make make things, make structs or enums with a, like a new method or something like that. Um, then we talked about how a vec works, which is basically a, a, a resizable list. Then we talked about box, which is a way of like dynamically uh, referring to something to say. Um, uh, like basically, it's a, it's a way of like saying, I have this fixed size thing, which is appointed to something which is part potentially variable sized on the heap. And then we talked about slices, uh, which are a way of referring to things inside VEX and strings. And of course, today we talked about strings and what they are. Okay, so that was um, uh, section A2. And I, I my next video will be me working through some of the exercises. Please do get in touch. Um, let me know uh, what's working for you with these videos and what's not. Um, and yeah, uh, if, if you're not bothered about watching me struggle my way through the exercises, skip the next video and we'll get on to more exciting stuff next time. Thanks for watching. See you next time.